thank you guys again for showing up. Last session of the day, last session of the conference, I think. You guys are either really committed or you're lost. I notice a lot of people in the aisle seats. I don't think that's going to make it any easier for you to get out. You make it to the door, I'm asking you an embarrassing question. Um, I'll, I'll repeat the, the sorry joke I brought in up earlier, but there are slides in this deck where we show some code. Uh, if you can't see it that well, um, you might want to move a little closer. Our, um, our uh, screen here was donated by the LA School of Optometry. Nothing? Really? Have you? That was the, that was, those are the jokes, folks. So I asked, and they said that only the screen is recorded. So when uh, when we start, I want it to sound like there's about a thousand people in here, because <laughs> I told my mom I was presenting, and she's really proud. <laughs> Thank you, six people. <laughs> that was that was that was about a thousand. Yeah, it's in the mail. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat that. <laughs> That's going to come in real handy. <laughs> Started too early. I'm gonna go long, so you need to start early. Oh, I can let them out early. <laughs> okay. Maybe we can get a feel for what people's uh, experience with um, the various parts of the ecosystem are. Like, show of hands, people have used panels before. Decent familiarity with that. And um, those of you who have used Angular. All right. And those of you who have been arrested. <laughs> this is going to be great. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to the right place. 
if I'm getting any closer, I'm going to swallow it. Is there it no way to lift? When uh -huh. That one doesn't lift up, does it? <laughs> All right, are we ready? Sure, whenever you're ready. All right, I guess we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Whoa. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, today we are going to be... Hmm? <laughs> One moment. I'm on the focus. Welcome, everybody. We'll try this again. Today, we will be talking about a novel presentation framework, which is a system we built for the weather.com project. My name is Matt Davis. I'm a senior Drupal developer for MediaCurrent. And I'm Jason Smith. I'm a senior software architect at the Weather Company. So this is our basic agenda uh, that we'll be going through today. Uh, first, we'll do a little introduction to the weather.com project uh, on Drupal. We'll talk a little bit about the problems they wanted us to help solve uh, from their legacy platforms. Um, and then we'll dive a little bit into our solution, uh, the internals of the presentation framework, uh, before opening up for any questions you all may have. But before we get too far in, let's talk a little bit about the what, the how, and the why. Um, so I'm here specifically to talk about the Weather Channel side of things. Uh, we're going to talk about the presentation framework in general and its, and its wider use. Um, when we were building this system for Weather Channel, we learned quite a few things about managing uh, large development efforts. Their, their projects are huge, uh, um, touch a lot of pieces of the, the site. There are many legacy platforms. There are many touch points. So we had to figure out how we can talk to all of them in a way that made sense that was easy to manage. They have huge dev teams. We needed to find a way to organize those dev teams so that they're not going you know, kind of crazy and doing their own thing. Uh, we had to deal with rapidly changing requirements. Um, as you know with the weather, if you don't like it, often you just wait five minutes and you got new weather. With Weather Channel, if you don't like the requirements, just wait five more. Um, we needed to develop for them a flexible and adaptable presentation to meet the requiring flexible and adaptable requirements. So what exactly is wrong with the traditional CMS model and what did we have to solve here? These are some of the problems that we ran into. Um, with the traditional Drupal site, you have very low control over the DOM unless you have uh, very experienced Drupal themers to deal with it. Um, so that leads to for designers who are not familiar with uh, Drupal's theme layer, uh, barriers to experimentation and innovation. Um, so if you don't have that knowledge, it slows things down, because if you are mainly familiar with Angular, you don't want to have to deal with learning all of, all of the Drupal theming system. So a lot of people are talking these days about headless systems and how headless systems can kind of uh, address some of these issues and let the front end teams uh, accomplish more without having to know so much about Drupal. But does Headless really solve these problems? Well, the, the Headless uh, idea has a lot of promise that comes with it. Uh, it offers higher scalability because the front end and the back end are decoupled, they can be scaled independently. Um, it can offer a richer user experience because front end developers can focus on what they do best. They can make uh, whatever innovative uh, designs that they can come up with. And that involves their ability to use whatever bleeding edge technology um, is available at the, at the time. As you know, uh, if you know something about JavaScript frameworks, it's a very lively uh, and rapidly changing ecosystem out there. Um, so in a headless uh, setup, you can use whatever framework you want. Um, and that also offers flat platform flexibility because you have a services layer between the front end and the back end. You can have multiple different front ends ingesting uh, the back end data in different ways for different devices, uh, which is the create once, publish everywhere idea. But. But with all the promise of headless, there's a lot of problems with the, with the headless model that we still have to figure out and solve. 
So one of the issues that we ran into specifically with the Weather Project is that the product owners wanted the ability to create and uh, maintain their own layouts and make new pages with different layouts uh, as rapidly as possible. And with a purely headless system, uh, they would have to rely on their design team to implement these. They couldn't do it themselves. Uh, there can also be sometimes front-end performance concerns. If you end up having to make multiple uh, calls to the services layer on a single page, then you're actually uh, multiplying the number of requests that you have to make. Um, redirects, aliasing, routing, all of that uh, fun stuff that Drupal has baked into it, you lose the ability to, to reach those things uh, from the front end if you're in a uh, wholly decoupled system. And other things like localization, internationalization, Drupal does very well, um, but you don't have access to all of that necessarily in a fully headless system. Same thing with SEO, meta tags. You know, we've worked very hard to develop these tools. There's no reason that the front end should have to reinvent these things. But one of the biggest things is that in a large enterprise level uh, set setup like this where we have a lot of moving parts and a large development team, uh, we in a fully headless system would have very little imposed structure, which means different people could be working on using different frameworks um, unless we impose some more structure on them, which it's leads to chaos. Chaos. General disarray. And general disarray. So the, the future does look to be some form of headless. I think you guys uh, probably attended the headless session hosted by uh, Josh Koenig and uh, Amitai. Um, it looks like that is a direction we're heading, and the tools just aren't there yet to support it. So many of us need to solve that problem today, so we need some sort of compromise. See, nothing? Really? I worked hard on that. <laughs> so you know, in, 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 the la in dealing with the lack of tools, we need to replace it with process and structure. We need guardrails. We need some sort of system with an opinionated uh, um, approach to how you should build the pages. So what we're trying to do is, is give you the compromise between a fully headless system and a traditional CMS approach. So uh, to kind of give you more insight into why we're making that decision, I'm going to take a little detour. Um, many of you guys have heard of a sonata, but a sonata is actually a musical form. It's made up of four or five pieces, depending upon who's doing it. There's an introduction where you kind of introduce a theme, an exposition where you kind of play with that theme, introduce new variations, a development where you kind of uh, extend it and, and do some wild new things with it, recapitulation, bring the theme back, and coda, and more extemporization. What, what's the point? Well, the sonata is a form, and it's a guide to composers as to the schematic for their works, for interpreters to understand the grammar and meaning of their work, and for listeners to understand the significance of the musical events. Does that sound familiar from a software perspective? So the recognizable structure, that is to say the process and the structure we, we supply, uh, helps to prevent developers from going crazy, which as we all know, they do. Three of them were arrested in this room. You guys were wondering what I was gonna do with that, didn't you? The boundaries of structure, I mean, that when a new developer comes on board, they only have to learn one thing, not 18 different approaches. And ideally, they're all taking the same approach when they're building a new, new module. Um, and yes, you do put some limits on what you're able to accomplish. But one of the nicest things about having a framework that tells you what you can and can't do is when you're asked to do something you can't do, you can say, no, I can't do that. And then you move on. So we can make beautiful. He, he got too fast. We're making music. See? <laughs> Killed that one. It was, it was really funny in practice. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about how we're using Drupal in the enterprise, headless Drupal. Uh, there's a little placard on there. That's John Luke Placard. No? <laughs> I worked hard on that one, too. All right. This one, oh, no, it's me. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do is that for specifically a, a group like the Weather Company, they have product owners. That's to say they want to build a today page or a five-day page. They don't want to have to uh, work with a development team in a series of cycles of iterations of trying to get every little piece right and then try out putting a module in the left, put a module in the right. They want to be able to have direct control over that, build out features as quickly as they possibly can. Their existing platform had a lot of trouble problems with it. It was really hard to develop new templates. You had to go through a development process. You had to go through a release process. There was a QA and regression cycle. It was a mess. 
um, it was hard to reuse templates. So if they had a template they were happy with, it was hard to find and then reapply in a different context. URL parity was hard to keep track of because each URL was a completely different uh, uh, approach into the system. So you'd basically have to have a map to find out where the URLs went. So panels came to the rescue. For their product owners to be able to manage all of this, they wanted, we knew that we wanted to give them the ability to use panels so that they could use variants to control URL parity across platforms and control how the variants were selected with selection rules and use whatever context was needed on a particular page, device that a page is being viewed by or location information um, to fuel those variants. So this allowed for layout control and reuse of content. Um, so here you see a typical uh, forecast page for the weather.com site uh, with all these separate pieces of content that are distinct. And this is a panels page. So on the back end, we have what you're probably familiar with if you've used the panels module, just a regular drag and drop interface where you can plug in these widgets um, and then configure them and move them where you need, and they can be reused across multiple pages. So how does the presentation framework play into that? Well, we want to give their product owners the ability to use these widgets, but where do these widgets come from, these content types? That's what the presentation framework does. It gives their front-end and editorial teams access to as much of Drupal's power as possible without making them learn the more complex parts of Drupal. So. So how does it do that? Well, we don't want to have their front-end team of 40 developers have to be trained in Drupal. They know Java, they know JavaScript, they know HTML. Uh, those are base skills, they're, and they're very strong with them, and we want them to be able to move as quickly as they can. So what the presentation framework is, is a system that wraps uh, modules, which are really just collections of template files, J JavaScript and CSS that shows up on the front end, into a mechanism that can be uh, shown in panels. So you remember that interface where we saw the widgets you can drag and drop so you could compose a page layout? Those widgets come from the presentation framework, which are just wrappers for the JavaScript and CSS developed by their front end team. So their front end team doesn't know any Drupal. Well, they know very little Drupal. So let's, um, we're going to talk at a high level. We'll give a high level architectural review. Then we're going to dig into a little bit more detail. Um, that would be the opportunity for project managers, product owners to take a nap. This is the architectural diagram that we're, we're using. You can see it's pretty simple. <laughs> well, that was funnier than I thought. Um, we, uh, we are obviously building in Drupal. Um, the, we use panels in the C-Tools module as a platform for the Angular Mods uh, or NG Panes system. And you can see it's all that does is allow us to wrap uh, um, the module plugins as content panes within the panel system. So I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. So uh, first up, Angular mods, ng panes. Go ahead. Uh, originally, it's Angular pa uh, mods and in Angular panes because that's the platform they chose to use. While working on the system, we realized it could be easily generalized. However, we'd already made uh, a commitment on the namespace. So ng panes is what the internal name of it is. We did do a fair amount of uh, time anal analyzing the code, thinking if there was some way to refactor it so that we could rename it and get the better namespace. And we did, in fact, do it. After a great deal of thought, we abandoned ng panes and went for next gen panes, or ng panes for short, which we think flows better. <laughs> there. So there are only two things that are hard in computer science, naming things and cache and validation. <laughs> and off by one error. So let's talk a little bit about the front end developer experience that we've built here. As you'll see uh, when we go into a little more detail here, we have these individual uh, Angular mods that are, com that are plug-in based. So Different uh, front-end developers can create their own Angular mods, which are independent-ish and self-contained, so that because of the structure we've imposed here, uh, they can be working on their own pieces without worrying about them breaking other things. So this is an example of what an individual Angular mod would look like in the file system. Uh, it's a directory that we have uh, set up to be listened to using a hook in our, our main Angular mod uh, module. Angular mods get directory. Um, and we listen to these directories and look for these info files. 
And the info files are just small pieces of JSON uh, that will uh, declare that this is, in fact, an Angular mod, and it will include any dependencies uh, from JavaScript, CSS, or other template files that they may want to use. So this is a little example of what uh, the beginning of one of these JSON files would look like. Um, as you can see, it's just declaring the basic information, categorizing it, um, and we can version it and have t specific time to live so that it can be cached independently. Um, and it is reflected directly into the panel's user interface as a content type. Uh, we talked earlier about the fact that you can have different types of templates. For example, you could have your Angular module do just one thing, spit an HTML blob onto the page, and that's all you ever really need. You might use that for something like a logo or a, um, a, a, a quote, for example. Um, I mean, it's not a terribly big module, but it's an easy one to write, and suddenly you've got the ability to drag and drop it on there. But we have more sophisticated tools, such as the ability to interpret tipple fips. Um, the nice thing about that is that it gives you a great deal of power. The downside of that is that it gives you a great deal of power. So we try not to tell anybody about it. <laughs> Oops. Um, hold on. Yeah, and here, as you see, this is another thing that's included in the JSON files, and this is another little bit of Drupal sneaking in there, but uh, you may recognize this uh, if you're familiar with the Drupal's Forms API. This is a JSONified version of that where uh, their front-end developers can write these little things, and these forms will actually uh, be shown up in the uh, pane configuration form. And here's an example of that happening. Uh, yeah, it's the exact same form. Uh, this is a very simple example, obviously, but they can get very complex, um, depending on the needs of that specific Angular mod. And in some cases, we even defined uh, custom field types uh, on the Drupal side that their teams could then use in their configurations. So another place where we leveraged what Drupal was able to provide instead of reinventing the wheel is, um, you know, there are plenty of uh, situations where we want to add JavaScript from the module itself, things like, you know, the JavaScript that supports an Angular module, the controller, the initializer, et cetera. Um, we provide the ability to list uh, the group that you want it to show up in, in in terms of aggregation, whether it's in the header or footer, the weight. You might recognize this as being very similar to what Drupal Add JS does, and there's a reason for that. That's what it is. <laughs> So what about cases where an individual Angular mod uh, wants to use the same JavaScript code or CSS as another Angular mod? Well, in that case, uh, when you know that your uh, piece of code is going to be uh, reused, you can declare it as a separate Angular mod, and then other Angular mods can use it as a dependency so that they're still kept separate, and we uh, reduce deduplication, um, reduce duplication, and this works for JavaScript, image libraries, uh, CSS, and you can see here how that's uh, accomplished in the JSON file declaring this Angular mod. You just declare what shared resources your module needs. Um, and how does all of this fit into the panel's integration exactly? So here's our architectural diagram for the actual module. So those of you familiar with CTools know that you really only t need to implement three functions to, to present the content pane. This module is no different. All we do is instead of reporting one module, we report, uh, well, in the case of Weather Company, 250 modules. Um, but it's all done via a single callback. So go ahead. Um, most of the magic for the module happens in the Angular Mods Get Metadata function. Uh, this is a uh, function that you can call from anywhere and is called in very many places. It walks all of the subscribing folders, those that were uh, announced through the which folder do I want hook. Um, parses and validates that info file. It actually does validate against JSON schema. There's a, uh, there is a schema validator out there. It's a fantastic tool. It saves us a ton of uh, problems because, for example, the, the biggest issue we dealt with in the beginning is malformed JSON. And if that were to happen invisibly, modules would just disappear. So we, um, we throw a wobbly, which is a technical term for error. Um, we also, as part of the Angular Mods Get Metadata function, um, read that uh, form API magic that we showed you earlier and turn it into something that makes more sense to the content type system. Uh, and lastly, we cache that metadata so that this call doesn't have to walk that file system tree over and over again. 
Um, one of the neat things about it is for our particular case, every time we do a code deployment, we go ahead and flush that metadata cache, so you're guaranteed to get the updated stuff every time. This is the um, plugin that, that uh, the C tool system calls. You, as you can see, it's pretty st typical, nothing unusual here. Um, in fact, we still have that single content type callback, but instead of returning one, we return 250 modules. So, um, in that content type callback, we call that function that we just introduced, the get metadata. It lists all of the modules for us. Um, each one of the info files has the option to specify a um, callback function if desired. There are situations where the name of the module isn't enough to provide context to the person dragging and dropping it onto the page. Sometimes they want to know what's the configuration for this module. But something A use case for that might be we've created a presentation framework module for an ad and we want to know is this ad in this position or in that position? Which one is it subscribing to? So we have callbacks and the uh, preview callbacks that you can um, show that information in panels while you're dragging and dropping it. Um, evaluate, validates the modules actually exist. So if at some point we've got a panel that uses a module, but uh, the code was later removed, we throw wobbly. Um, if the module code changes out from under the structure we expect, we throw a wobbly. If the module tries to validate uh, a property that doesn't actually exist because we defined a new property, it throws a wobbly. I didn't want to get too repetitive. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we also have a config callback, which again, if you're familiar with creating these CTools content types plugins, um, you'll be aware of. It, it does exactly what you see here. It ingests the form API JSONified version and turns it into the actual form uh, that is shown when you're configuring your content type. Um, it also uh, matches and makes sure that your module type is correct and it serializes it all up and it actually becomes a, a C-Tools exportable, so it's cacheable and featureable, featureizable as well. All right, and so uh, lastly, we have the render callback. This is where we, um, we actually put the module onto the page. Now, you, you recall that during the config callback, we, we uh, serialize the data into the panel config. Um, one of the nice things about that is that if you featureize a page containing a module and that config is on there, the config goes with the feature that's exporting that page. So we can now uh, develop a full page, featureize it, export it, put it on another site, bring in everything, and all the magic goes with it. Uh, the render call callback loads any shared dependent modules, automatically dedupes them for you. Uh, loads any JavaScript or CSS into the attached uh, part of the render array that it spits out. It does this specifically so that you can cache the output because if you were to simply call Drupal add JS the second time the module's called, your JavaScript disappears. Um, I call that to attention because there are a lot of things that can go wrong when you're trying to build a system like this, and we've tried to you know attend to all of them. Um, the last thing it does is that config that we collected as part of that form API thing you built, we drop that into Drupal settings, though you have the option to whitelist what actually shows up there. For example, if you had to add configuration and you wanted to put some authentication to in the uh, module, it would be only used on the server side, not shown on the client side. Go ahead. Um, we have a ton of stuff that the presentation framework actually does, and I know that this probably is a bit dry. I was hoping that we can cover a lot more in the QA, or more likely get out of here as quickly as possible. One of the benefits of being the last one of the day. Um, the presentation framework is pluggable and uh, exportable for the reasons I just described, so that's a really handy tool because it allows you to do your builds in dev and deploy them to prod either by doing database or uh, doing feature exports. Caching is built in, and we've, we've solved a lot of the hard problems there. Uh, dependency resolution just works. Um, if you have two modules that use the same shared resource, getting them not to load twice you know, in certain circumstances, particularly when caching is involved, is really a challenge. Um, and for example, let's say you've cached module A with version one of a, a dependent library, and you have uh, module B that uses the same library, but now the version available is two, we throw a wobbly. We're big on wobblies. 
Um, we're working right now, as we speak, on localization support. Uh, the way that will work is you'll drop a PO file with the English translation into the module folder. It'll automatically be ingested, dropped into the locales table, and then it can be either uh, consumed by your TMS vendor. We're working with both Smartling and Lingotech. Hope they're here. Hi, guys. Um, and then it will be automatically translated, the locale tape populated, and eventually, though this is not in the short term, we'll put the PO file back in the module file for every translation available. Um, okay, but what does all that actually look like in use on the site? So this, once again, is what our site looks like, a typical page here. And you'll see each one of those pieces, each section is a separate Angular mod that their front-end team developed without having to know Drupal's APIs and without having to ask us for much once we had the system in place. And so just to give you an idea of how this is powerful for us, you know, you know, leveraging the power of Headless, leveraging the power of Drupal, this is what the Weather Channel architecture looks like for, for example, the Today page. Drupal spits out just that page for every user of the site because that's the only part of the page that's consistent across every user. The forecast data is different for every user, so we don't put it on the base page. That's what's actually cached by Akamai and Varnish, and that's what actually reaches the browser. Any data that we have that changes on a per-user basis is put into a key value store in the cloud. We have a data caching layer, which is uh, backed by both Cassandra, MongoDB, and Scala for some, for some logic layer. Um, so we use Angular on the front end go ahead, to dynamically populate the, the, the data that's unique to the visitor. So uh, with this system, even though we have something on the order of you know, 11 billion locations, we only serve one page out of Drupal. So we effectively can cache this stuff forever. We have 99.5% cache offload at Akamai and an additional 90% cache offload at Varnish. So our Drupal servers are doing nothing. So how did this actually help to improve product velocity? Well, as was mentioned, their front-end development team had made over 250 of these things. So this is actually just a slice of them. Um, they have really run with this system, and uh, we have not had to be that involved in a lot of it. So how does the presentation framework offer all of the promise of headless? Well. We still have the high scalability of a decoupled system. We still have a rich user experience that we're offering. Uh, bleeding edge technology, well, we've settled on Angular JS for now, but we are actively working on making this framework extendable. Um, and so in the future, we could theoretically change frameworks without having to change the data layer or the Drupal system. And as far as platform flexibility, because we have that services layer in there, uh, the cell phone app can ingest the data in a completely separate way. What about the problems of Headless that we talked about? Well, we've answered each one of these as well with the presentation framework. As you've seen, because we're using panels and CTOOLS content types, we have given their product owners total control over layout. Um, we're using a sophisticated caching system that mitigates many of the performance issues that could arise in a Headless system and we still have access to all of the Drupal goodies in terms of localization, SEO, and aliasing and routes. And the biggest thing, again, is that we've imposed a structure that allows their front-end teams to still have a lot of creativity and to still make very cool things, but within a very specific set of parameters. So just to kind of conclude again, go ahead. Because <laughs> I do it better. Uh, the presentation framework provides reusable widgets. We uh, provide strict guidelines about how the modules are created, and we tell you exactly how you're supposed to interface with the system. We're not enforcing just that you're using Angular or just that you're using the HTML or tipple FIP in a certain way. We're also imposing, by way of what is possible through the module, a uh, architectural or enterprise architectural pattern. That is to say, decoupled. We're making it hard for them to break that pattern and making it easier for us to cache pages. So you can see by, by having this system in place, we're not only benefiting from all those th things that we that he just talked about, which I kind of zoned out at. You also get. <laughs> we also. Um, oh man, I lost my train of thought. Completely yes. derailed. Present, I said something witty. 
<laughs> All right, so um, each of the modules is independent. Each of the developers can work in a silo. And as we know, developers are most effective when they know that they can work as uh, quickly as they want to and know that they're not going to impact the work of other people. So the, the isolation between modules, the shared modules with the version dependencies, the fact that we show strict warnings and we're very careful about tracking them, this means that developers can work quickly and without fear. If they do something they're not supposed to know, do, they know quickly. Oh, and I didn't put it up here, but the other thing is that, you know, as a result of switching from the old platform to what, you know, our Drupal deployment system, uh, we can turn around, we can do releases a lot more quickly. I mean, the old release schedule was, you know, get 25 people in a room, huddle up, and, you know, pray for the best. The new release system is so boring, nobody even knows it's happening. They do several releases a day. Um, we're shooting towards getting them on an hourly basis. The primary things holding us back at this point are, are unit testing, which I think is probably something that a lot of people are having pain with. So, so what about contribu contributed work that's come out of this project? Um, well, we've had an uh, opportunity to contribute several little pieces of code back so far. Um, we have the classy panel styles module that is maintained by Derek Durapps and Kendall Totten uh, of Media Current, and that is basically a way of uh, getting a higher fidelity version uh, in the panel's user interface um, that looks more like what you'll actually see on the front end side. Um, we have the WYSI field sandbox that's being maintained by Bob Kepford of Media Current. Um, and this is something we didn't really touch on much, but there's a whole other way that we can use these Angular mods on the site. Um, for example, in articles uh, on the weather site uh, may have embedded slideshows or videos inside of them. Um, and so the WYSI field module allows uh, from the WYSIWYG in the article body uh, field, you can actually add these Angular mods um, straight from the WYSIWYG. Uh, there's also the panels theme override, which is a very small module that I'm maintaining that allows you to override the theme that will be used on a per variant basis. Um, and the big one that we are still currently working on is making the presentation framework as a whole contributed back to the community. Um, we do not quite have it in a sandbox state yet. Um, we're trying to make sure that it will be flexible enough to be used without, without being dependent on uh, AngularJS and having, having it be open to other frameworks. Um, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, but we would love to, if you all are interested in helping us, to show you the code um, and to maybe do a sprint on that. So that's about it. Um, I'm from Media Current, and Media Current is an amazing place to work. Uh, it is a distributed company uh, full of very, very intelligent people, and we are hiring. Uh, and I, again, I'm Jason Smith. I work at the Weather Company, and there is an intelligent person working there. <laughs> okay, there are lots of intelligent people working there. I fit right in. Um, it's a great place to work. The culture is great. They've got offices in New York, San Francisco, uh, London, um, all over the place. Uh, and we are actively looking for Drupal developers. So if you're interested in working on bleeding edge technology or contributing back to open source in what I think is a really meaningful and, and progressive way, we'd be interested in talking to you. And please leave us thumbs up in the session thing. <laughs> we'll be happy to take any questions. If yeah. People want to approach the mic up here. Yeah, a really beautiful piece of work. <laughs> That's what my mother says. Um, I she's really the only like, one. Just seems like you know, so many things right. I'm, one Can question. You closer to the mic. I don't know if the mic is. There we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you practically have so to swallow it. Repeat, um, beautiful piece of work. I think everybody can see that. Um, the question is about these Angular mods. Can they do anything outside of their box? Um, do they have information? I mean, I guess they can get it from from the browser. But what if somebody wanted, you know, to have an uh, an effect in JavaScript where they would they would go outside the the, the boxes? Yeah, that's a good question. So he, he asked, you know, can the modules get any information outside of what they get on the front end? And I think more specifically, can, can they leverage any of the data in Drupal? So one of the things we didn't talk about is that these are, these are content panes, so they can consume context. Uh, that is to say, panels context, not context module, which is uh, inferior in every way. Um, 
Again, I'm very opinionated. Um, the the context would have to be defined by somebody uh, who does know Drupal, um, but once you define the context, and in our case we have a location context, once you create a context that is visible to panels, whenever that context is available, you can specify in the info file in the JSON that you want to use it, and what will happen is it will show up in that configure that's both in the Drupal settings and in the object that's passed to the tipple FIP to operate on. So yes, you can leverage data that's in Drupal. Hey guys, uh, great presentation. The the past two core conversations have been talking about similar ideas in somewhat hypothetical terms, and it's really inspiring to see the one of the largest or the largest website in the world just doing it. Uh, what would you want to see in Drupal 8, either Drupal 8 Contrib or maybe 8.1, 8.2, to make this kind of organization easier in, in Drupal 8? Panels. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want panels ready for Drupal 8 as soon as possible, too. Uh, no, I mean, most of the, the grunt work is the interf is the glue between what happens, um, you know, wrapping their modules and panels. I mean, so we leverage heavily what panels provides. Mm -hmm. I mean, panels does 90% of the heavy lifting here. Uh, to the ex you know, it provides a caching uh, framework for us. It provides a presentation framework for us. It provides a URL mitigation framework for us, a URL par parity uh, framework. It allows us to do the variance and the selection rules. I mean, really, this is a presentation about how panels can be extended, not so much about, you know, what we've done. What we've done is take it to the next step and allow you to decouple a little bit. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I we need panels. <laughs> sure. So, uh, d would you plan then to build on the, the layout module that's in Contrib right now? It seems like um, you're, you're building on the content type um, plugin system. Uh, in, I, I suppose you could certainly do the same in, in Drupal 8 and extend the the block concept, which I think is combining cores blocks concept with the Drupal 7 uh, panel pane content type concept. Uh, I could also see an argument for doing this kind of organization at uh, the layout plugin level. Um, Absolutely, yeah, and I did look at it. It wasn't quite mature enough to do something right now. Um, but one of the things that, for example, is a gap on the panel side that maybe we could, you know, while we're early in the process on the Drupal 8 side, is that um, one of our big initiatives at the Weather t Company is that we want to build a fully responsive site. And building fully responsive at the theme layer is easy, you, you know, or it's easy-ish. But providing a user interface that you know allows a product owner to, to lay out a page so that it behaves one way on this browser, a different way on a tablet, and a different way on a desktop, and a consistent experience without significant training is a big challenge. And so, you know, what would really help is is bridging the gap in terms of um, what the behavior is going to be on the front end and the back end. I've seen some really neat uh, uh, moves towards that. You know, radio boxes at the top that'll choose you know, the different breakpoints that you, so you can predict. But, you know, you have to go a step further because if, for example, we have an ad that want to appear on the right sidebar in one situation, but in the header in a different situation, we have to relate those in a way that's hard to express uh, sure. visually. Okay. So. Thanks, guys. Anybody else? You guys just want to go home. <laughs> we do, too. It's okay. Yeah. Del Thank you. Yeah, we're happy to talk to anyone who wants to come up afterwards. Thanks for listening. Thank you guys for choosing us over Drees.